Um, this happened this week. I've had this slow drip going on out of my office ceiling. It's been contained with just my trash can for about the last two months. If you've been in the gym bathrooms lately, you will have noticed that uh, they've been shutting toilets off. And you're probably thinking, what is going on there? Well, they're shutting toilets off one at a time to try to isolate the problem. Well, this week, it really went bad because not only was, was one uh, trash can getting, getting used, but then there was other drips that were falling closer to the bookshelf. So we went and got another trash can. And that, that uh, <coughs> caused a call to the plumber and said, hey, we really need some help here. So he came down and then he, he put a bucket and he started taking panels out of the, the, the ceiling. You could see the insulation was down. Stuff was dripping all over. It still looks like this right now. We had to pull chairs out. We had to pull all sorts of stuff out. I didn't have to move the bookshelves yet. Thankfully, we didn't pull a TV off the wall, but it's kind of a mess. I think we're going to figure it out. I think we've got it isolated to one of the two urinals in the men's room. So in case you're wondering, I I think that's what the problem is. Not that you came here for a plumbing, uh, for a plumbing issue, but have you ever had a leak in your house or maybe in your office or maybe someplace else? It's kind of terrible because it can be difficult to isolate and that little drip, it usually doesn't go away. It usually turns from a drip into maybe a trickle into maybe even worse. It's like some kind of gushing. And then you've got a real problem. And then you're into, into a, a big, big, big project. I've had this happen before. It's, it's a major, major pain. And it can create a lot of a mess because water is this irresistible kind of thing. It finds a way through and it causes issues. And, and you could get mold. And there's all sorts of stuff that can come about because of just a little water leak. What started with a little water leak? I want to compare that this morning to uh, sin in our lives. Because we are, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're saved by grace through faith. What happens at that moment is, is you have a new creation, you're a new nature that is given to you. Before that, you just have an old nature, a sin nature that just loves the world and loves doing the things of the world and is, is motivated by the passions of the flesh and the, the eyes, the pride of life, the scripture says. But when you become a follower of Jesus, now you have a new nature that, not, that is not geared towards those old things, but is geared towards God and loving him. And not only that, but you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And yet... If you're anything like me, you still find yourself struggling against that old nature, that sin nature, with pride or lust or anger or greed, or we we could go down the list of various sins. And sometimes it's like just a little drip, just this little drip, and we think, oh, it's not a big deal. It's just a drip. I'll put a trash can underneath of it. It'll catch it. It'll be fine. It's not going to create a big mess. But that's not the way sin is. Sin isn't just a little drip. It's like that water and it will inevitably get bigger and get worse. And the damage will spread. And then you put that next to this, this idea that last week I brought up out of the life of Joseph that God is up to something in our lives. We've got, we've got this canvas up here. Last week, I don't know if you noticed, it was all white. This week it has some stuff on it. I'm not responsible for this. I didn't do it. It looks really good. Some, some artistic people are doing it. They're, they're going to be progressively putting some stuff on it and I don't know if they're master artists, but they're really good artists. And the thing I talked about last week was God is, is doing things in our, our lives, and we may not understand what they are. We, we see something, like you see this flourish of color, and you think, well, that's kind of cool, but what is it? Well, sin is like God is painting something on the canvas of our lives, and we go up <laughs> with, with, and get our hands in the paints, and we just start spreading random colors and brown and ugly stuff all over the place. Creates chaos on the canvas of our life. So we're going to look at a story this morning in Genesis 38, if you want to turn there, and we are gonna, we're going to be thinking about what is, 
what is to be done about the this sin in our life? How do we how do we deal with it? How do we think about it? So Genesis chapter 38, this is on page 32 in the Sanctuary Bibles, if you have those. If you don't have a Bible, we believe the Bible is the Word of God. We would just encourage you to pick that one up, take it home as a gift from us at the church. Please read it. Pastor Matt has put together a reading plan. We have those out at the Welcome Center. And I'll tell you, this week, I said this on several occasions to people, smart pastors skip Genesis 38. Okay? This is not the normal, like, I normally have, like, about three points. I've got nine. I've got nine points because I want to I give some context because this text this morning is, it's weird. I'm just going to say it. There's some strange, interesting stuff going on in Genesis chapter 38. It's one of those chapters that maybe you've skipped over or maybe you read through real fast and you think, wow, I have no idea why God put that in the Bible. So we're gonna we're gonna I wanna give some some context for Genesis thirty eight. It's actually for, for all of the scripture, much of the scripture, but uh, Genesis thirty eight, these are important things for us to remember. Contextual thing number one. Who was the book of Genesis written to? Genesis to Deuteronomy, what the, the Jewish people knew as the Torah or the law, was written, we think, by Moses after the year about fourteen forty six BC to the children of Israel as they are wandering in the desert. Now, why is that important? Because where do they come from? Well, they came from Egypt, this pagan polytheistic culture that they worshipped many gods, not the, God, the one true God. Where are they going? They're going to the land of Canaan. Who's it filled with? It's filled with pagan polytheistic people. So it's written by Moses to these people trying to prepare them for going into the land. Okay, that's important for us to grasp and to remember. Okay, number two. It's written to people for whom the group, now this is so counter to who we are in America today. It's written to, pe- to people for whom the group was more important than the individual. We don't even really have a context or understanding of this in the United States of America today. This is so counter to who we are. We're individualistic, we are self-sufficient, we are self-reliant. But these people, they relied on their family and their tribe to survive and to live. And so the emphasis was way more that direction than it is on the individual. So that's another important thing to remember. Thirdly, it's related to number two. For these people, genealogy and descent was very, very important. It's a little important for us today. It's, it's somewhat important. But, but if you go through the scriptures, you find lots of lists of names of people. They thought it very important to keep track of who was related to who, who had begat whom, who was your grandfather, your great-grandfather, who, who were they all related to. This was really, really, really important. Fourth, this was also written, and this is going to become interesting and apparent today, to a culture in which women did not work outside the home. I was having a conversation this week because I was like bashing my head against this text. And so I came out of my office and there was these two gals in the office. And I said, hey, what, what do you think about this? And so we were chatting about it for 20 minutes. That conversation couldn't have happened back during Bible times because women would not have been working in the workplace. Okay, so that's some context uh, of the culture. A couple other things I'd like us to think about, because we, we look at this text, at least I did, and I thought, Lord, why? Why did you put this in here? But then you have to remember 2 Timothy 3.16, which says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful. Really? Genesis 38 is useful? We haven't even got to it yet. But is, is useful or profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So, so no, no matter how difficult or odd the text is, we have something we can learn and take away from it. Lastly, I just want to emphasize this. Sometimes you come to a story in the Bible, and, and people, people who are uh, cynics of the Bible, maybe they're agnostics, atheists, they'll point to a Bible story and they say, see, the Bible is full of all these, these bad stories. The Bible condones this or condones that. Just because the Bible says something does not mean it's condoning that thing. Sometimes it's condoning it. Sometimes it's holding it up as a model. Often, though, it's holding up it as a, a negative model, something that we should not do. And I think there's a lot of that going on in Genesis 38. Okay, so with all of that as kind of background, we're going to just jump into Genesis 38. 
this morning. And I think one of the big things we're going to see is that when God's people sin, remember the little drip? It's not just a little drip. When God's people sin, it creates absolute chaos. It creates chaos. It's not just something that we can excuse. It's not just something that we can, we can kind of laugh about. When God's people sin, it creates chaos. And that's what we see in this story. Genesis 38, verse 1. It happened at that time. Now, at what time? Now, if you remember Genesis 37, Joseph had just gotten sold into slavery in Egypt. Now, Genesis 38 is not a, a part of the Joseph. I mean, it's part of the Joseph story, but it's not about Joseph at all. It's about Judah, his brother. Interesting, because in Genesis 37, Judah was the one who said, hey, let's sell Joseph to these guys. Let's make some money. Let's profit from him. So here in Genesis 38, we're following Judah. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite, whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua, he took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son, and he called his, his name Ur. Oh yeah, I forgot. Parents, you're going to have some things to talk with your kids about after this sermon. Okay, there's some, there's some adult things in here. We're not going to like belabor the point, but there's words in here that they may ask about later. Miss Kimberly has put together a little, uh, a little sheet that you can get out at the Welcome Center, I believe, that uh, you could have a conversation with your kids about. So, we got Judah. He goes out. He marries this woman, the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. This is the first issue. This is a problem. See, in our like modern individualistic kind of thinking, we think, well, you should just be able to marry whoever you want. To the Jewish mind, though, they understood that they were set apart by God to be this holy people and that they were not to to marry outside of their group. In fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, God says this specifically. He says, you shall not intermarry with them. With who? With the people of the land, the Canaanites. This lady is a Canaanite. Hittites, Jebusites. There's a whole list of ites. You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. Why? For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. So here you have Judah and he goes down, he sees this woman, she looks good to him. He says, I'm going to marry her, I don't care if she's a Canaanite. I'm not, I'm not that concerned with her, her religious uh, beliefs or, or what she thinks. I, I just want to marry her, okay. Well, Deuteronomy, you could say Deuteronomy 7 was written after Judah's life. Fair enough. But Judah's grandpa, great-grandpa, Abraham, when he was looking for a wife for his son Isaac said to his servant, Swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife from my son. From who? From the daughters of the Canaanites. So Judah should have been able to look back at the example that was set before him and known not to do this. In Genesis 26, Isaac and Rebekah, Esau goes out. He's, he's their son. When Esau was 40, he took Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, to be his wife, and Bazemuth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. Hittites were also on the list. They were not part of the people of God, and they made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. So here you have Judah, and he's married this Canaanite woman just because he feel like, feels like it and he wants to. And what we're going to see is that this sows chaos in his life and in his family. In fact, in, it's passed on to us, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. This is to us, to New Testament people. It says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. That's not only talking about marriage, but it certainly applies to marriage. The people of God are not to be intimately connected in a marriage relationship with people who don't know and love and serve God. And when they are, it's going to sow chaos. So back to our story. She conceived and bore a son. There's going to be three sons. And he called his name Ur. Verse 4, she conceived again and bore a son and called his name Onan. Verse 5, yet again she bore a son and she called his name Shelah. Now Judah was in Kezib when she bore him. So you got these three sons, Ur, Onan, Shelah. 
You think, okay, well, this is just this happy little family, Judah, and, and this, this unnamed Canaanite woman. It looks like they're doing pretty good. Then it, it starts to turn a little bit different. Verse 6, and Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. Now, we don't know for sure, but we think probably Tamar was another Canaanite woman. They were living in this area where there was Canaanites. Probably Tamar was Canaanite as well. So up to this point, we're, we're just, oh, okay, this is what's going on in Judah's life. No big deal. But in verse 7... We see something. There's this sinister thing at play. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Now, we don't know what Ur had done. We don't know if he's a jerk to his neighbor. We don't know if he's ripping people off. We don't know if he's a murderer. We don't know if he's an adulterer. We have no idea. Interestingly, though, this is the first person that's in the scripture that it says God just had enough and put him to death. This guy, Ur, who was part of the family of blessing, but who had a Canaanite mother. Now, what's going out on a limb, we don't know for sure, but I would imagine, where did this wicked son come from? He came out of that household in which his dad had said, you know what, it's not a big deal who I marry. I'll just marry whoever I want. So he married this woman who probably had nothing going on with the Lord, Probably there were idols worshipped in their home, and he had learned to be wicked in that home. And so we see that the seeds that were planted in Judah's disobedience are beginning to bear fruit. Verse 8, it gets even weirder. Then Judah said to Onan, and there's a lot of explaining that needs to go into this. Then Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife. And perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. Now, this is probably the weirdest thing in the whole text to our mind. We think, what is going on here? But remember, for these people, what happened with the group and the family was more important than what happened for the individual. Remember that? And descent and inheritance was a super big deal. So, God, God said some things. This is Deuteronomy 25. This is called uh, leveret marriage. I'll, I'll get to a slide about that in a second. But it says, If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as, a, as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And, verse 6, The first son whom she bears shall succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. So God and the people, they thought it was so important that the name of this oldest son be passed down and that that the, the inheritance that they had not go outside the family, be passed down within the family. And so they had this thing called leveret marriage. Now, this was not unique to the Jewish people. It was, not, it was, it was pretty prolific throughout the, the Near East. Many ancient Near Eastern societies practiced this. This is according to the Lexham Bible Dictionary, including Babylon, Assyria, the Hittites, Nuzi, and Ugarit. The custom was also present in parts of modern Africa and Asia. And in much of the ancient Near East, the goal of such a practice was to preserve a family's inheritance. Because the property could pass to that, that woman, and then if she got married outside of the family, then, then a new family would own the property. So to keep things in the family and to provide for, for the, the, the woman, the widow, because she couldn't go get a job, there was this system. Now, it sounds really weird, foreign to us, and it is. I'm thankful this isn't a thing today. Verse 9, but Onan, this is where this guy is, is bad news too. Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. Now here's a little math Onan is doing. In their, their culture, the oldest son would have two uh, portions of the inheritance. There's three sons, so the inheritance of his father would be divided into four ways. So his oldest brother Ur would get two of those or half of those, and he would get 25% as the second son. But his older brother's dead. So now you divide dad's stuff by three. And he gets two of those. 
So instead of 25%, he gets 66% of the inheritance. And that sounds pretty good to own it. That's a lot more, over double. So he's not a good dude. He knew that the offspring would not be his. He knew that the inheritance would not be his. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so that as not to give offspring to his brother. So he's supposed to go in and provide an heir for his brother, having a sexual relationship with his sister-in-law. And so he would go in and he would act like he was doing what he was supposed to be doing. But he wouldn't really. So he would use this woman for his own pleasure. Everyone would think he was doing the upright, outstanding thing. And yet he wasn't really. So verse 10, what did the Lord do? And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord. And he, the Lord, put him to death also. So you just see, Judah married this Canaanite woman. They had this, this household that was not God-fearing. And you see the, fir- the fruit in the first two sons. Neither one of them were following the Lord at all. They were just doing whatever they wanted. Sin had become this gushing thing in their family. Verse 11, then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law. Now, Judah, he, he only has one son left. He says, remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up, for he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. I think what we see from this is that sin just creates chaos wherever it is. Whether it's in the the people of God, whether it's, it's outside the people of God, it just, whatever it does, it's like water. It just creates a mess. Creates chaos. So that's the truth, but, but there's this hope that we see in the, the rest of, of the chapter and as we look into the, the rest of the Bible. We see that in spite of this chaos, and this is hopeful, because I'm a sinful guy. I'm not perfect. But if sin is like, like a kid taking their hand to some kind of canvas that has a beautiful painting started on it and just go into town, you think, well, maybe it's ruined What we see in the rest of the the chapter and and looking into the Bible is that God will accomplish his purpose anyway. It's not that the sin goes away. We saw Judah is bearing the consequences. We saw Ur died. We saw Onan die. There's very real consequences, but God is somehow going to use that to accomplish his purpose anyway. So we, we have this lady Tamar, and she's kind of the only one who's acting well. Verse 12, in the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. So Judah's Canaanite wife dies. When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shears, and he and his friend Hira the Adolamite. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up, and sat at the entrance to Anayim, which is on the road to Timnah. Why? For she saw that Shelah was grown up, and she had not been given to him in marriage. Now she had a right to be married to Shayla, so that he could provide an heir for her. That was her right in, in their, uh, their culture. So what is about to happen, <laughs> all the commentators agree, what she's about to do is, is risky and dangerous, but within her rights as a woman in that culture. It's sort of ingenious. It's definitely icky. Verse 15, when Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, come, let me come into you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. Right? She's tricking him right here. She said, what will you give me now that the bartering starts, that you may come into me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, if you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, what pledge shall I give you? She replied, your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. Just so you know, this is like your, uh, your driver's license, your credit card, stuff that only you could have. It's your identification. So he gave them to her and, she, and, he, and went into her and she conceived by him. Verse 19, then she arose and went away and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. Widowhood. 
Then Judah says, okay, I got to get my stuff back. Verse 20, and Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adolamite, to take back the pledge from the woman's hand. He did not find her. And he asked the men of the place, where's the cult prostitute? Who is at Anayim at the roadside? And they said, no cult prostitute has been here. Sorry. Verse 22, so he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also, the men of the place said, no cult prostitute has been here. So Judah's, Judah's wondering what's going on. Tamar has, has manipulated the situation. She's got what was owed her through trickery. She's conceived uh, children. Verse 23, and Judah replied, let her keep the things as her own or we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent this young goat and you did not find her. And then there's the punchline. It's very ironic. Funny in a really sad sort of way. Verse 24. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Now just stop there. Tamar has been immoral. What about Judah? Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah, in, in the text doesn't say this, but you just got to think that he's thinking, okay, I can finally be done with this problem. Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. I'm going to get rid of her. Verse 25. And as she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, by the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. In other words, these are your children. I'm pregnant by you. And then notice what Judah says. Judah identified them and said, these are fantastic words. She is more righteous than I. Get that. This woman who dressed herself as a prostitute to, get, to trick her father-in-law into getting her pregnant so she could have uh, children like she was owed in that culture. She is more righteous than I since I did not give her to my son Shayla and he did not know her again. And commentators think, and it's very interesting, you look at just the arc of Judah. So you have Joseph and you have Judah, kind of going back in this, this part of the Joseph story. Last chapter of Joseph, Judah was the one who said, let's sell, let's sell him. This chapter is focused on Judah, and Judah acts terrible the whole time. But at the end, he comes around and it's like he has this aha moment. He sees it. And in a few chapters, Judah is going to be the key person when he's bar bargaining back and forth with the man that, that is in charge, they don't know it's Joseph. He's going to be the key who, who's going back and forth, and he's had this transformation. He's gone from only caring about himself to offering himself in the place of his brother Benjamin. And we wonder, is it this moment that he starts to realize how his own sin has created chaos in his family. When he says, she is more righteous than I. So we see God accomplishing his purpose maybe in Judah's life, in Tamar's life. But, but in, in, a, in a bigger way, verse 27, it, it doesn't start there. There's stop there. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, one put out a hand. I mean, this is odd. And the, the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand saying, this one came out first. Okay, we're going to mark the baby. They didn't probably know there was twins in there. It, you know, they didn't have ultrasounds like we have. Verse 29. But as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out, and she said, What a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore, his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out with a scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was Zerah. That's the end of the story. Except it's not. Because if you flip in your Bible a few books, there's this wonderful little book called Ruth. And Ruth is the story of this Moabite woman who marries in to the family of Judah. And you're like, oh, that's a cute little story. 
how that happened, Ruth and Boaz. It's really nice. But at the end of Ruth, we find this. Now, these are the generations of who? Of Perez. Perez. Born from Judah and Tamar. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nation. Nation fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. So we see God took this hot mess of a family. And this guy, he had not obeyed God at all. But he's the kind of God who can take that and he can make it into something amazing. And it doesn't stop there because in the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, we see this. The genealogy. Don't, don't miss it. I mean, like, you look at Genesis 38, you're like, man, I don't want anything to do with that family. Guess what? If you're a Christian today, you're spiritually part of that family. This is our family. <laughs> This is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. And Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, etc., etc., all the way down to Jesus. So we see that God is able to take this story, Genesis 38, in all its odd weirdness, terrible, sordid details. And he was able to use it to bring about King David and to bring about his Messiah. That's who our God is. He can take the the chaos, even the chaos that, that we sow in our lives because of sin, and he can use it for his purpose and his glory. That doesn't mean he's going to let us off the hook. Judah had to pay a price. Judah's sons paid a price. But God was able to use it for his purpose. So, so what does this mean? I, I think one of the things it means is, and it, as you think about it, to the children of Israel, what is Moses trying to say? He's trying to say to them, you guys, you got to obey what God says. You got to know it. You got to obey it. If you don't, it's going to sow chaos in your life. Obey God's word. So here's a question. Do you, do you know it? Do you know what God's will is for you? Every week we stand up and we, we teach out of the Bible and we, we, we give away Bibles. And the reason is because this is how we know what God's will is for us. We put together Bible reading plans so that, so that hopefully people will read the scriptures and know what God's word says and be able to apply it to their life so that they can obey it. So if you're, you're not in it, it's January still. It'd be a great time to jump into a Bible reading plan. I'm reading through the scripture this year. I'm, I'm almost through Genesis right now in my Bible reading. There's a, a Bible reading plan out there. We're, we've got this little uh, memorization thing we have going, the Hebrews 11 challenge. I encourage you to grab one of these if you would like. They're really nice. You can take one of those. There's 40 verses. There's 52 weeks in the year. You can do the math. It's not even one a week. You can memorize one of the best chapters of the Bible, but you need to know it if you're going to obey it. Secondly, are there places where you're not obeying his word? There, there's, there's a number in here. You think about it. Judah doesn't find a godly spouse. If you're here and you're not married, one of the things I think Genesis 38 is saying is, hey, take seriously what God says about picking and finding a spouse. It's a big deal. Another thing it talks about is greed. Onan did what he did because he was greedy. What's your relationship to money? What's my relationship to money? Do I think it's all mine? One of the reasons we give is to love God, but also so that money doesn't have such a hold on our hearts. Other places where we're not obeying God's word, where we know what it says and we just think, ah, I don't want to do that. That'd be too hard. Lastly, you want to obey God's word? You're going to need other people. 
That's why God has put us in community with one another. That's why we talk about connections groups. And our hope in a connections group is that you'll go there and you'll meet people and they'll, you'll be able to share your life with them and you'll be able to pray for one another and share what's really going on, what you're really struggling with. Because on my own, on your own, we're not strong enough to obey God's word. And friends, sin is like water. It will drip, and it will find a way, and it will get bigger, and it will create havoc and a mess and chaos in your life. But our God, He's able, if we come to Him in confession and repentance, He's able to even take that and use it for His purpose and His glory. So Lord, I just would pray for myself and my brothers and sisters, Lord, that we would take seriously the sin in our own lives, in our own hearts, or that we would know uh, how, how deep it runs, how bad it is, that we wouldn't just laugh about it, we wouldn't turn a blind eye to it, we would take it seriously, we would confess it. That when we come in confession, in repentance, Lord, we would, we would know that we are accepted in love because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. Father, would you use even that in, in our confession of it to others? Would you use it for your purpose and your glory? I pray in your name. Amen.